In April of 2017, I decided to get kind of serious about creating content, putting a lot of it on YouTube, but that required a place to do so. So when we got this new building, same time in 2017, we built out this area to be the studio. And we put a lot of sound deadening and stuff like that up. Um, those are some of the basics. But then it's now time to upgrade it a lot further. So I did that. And I was going to time lapse. The problem is it kept happening over months, not even, you know, one idea or one rebuild with a plan. It's kind of like been tweaking over time. So I figured I'd do this August of 2019 status update of where it's at. And of course, as I come up with new ideas, I'm always going to be evolving and updating the studio. But before we get deeper into all the gadgetry that drives the studio, uh, one of the things that's very important, I just want to remind people all the time, it's not a about the gadgets it's about content it's about story it's about having what you want to tell put together that is the first step before you figuring out what gadgets you need so this is not necessarily a place to start when it comes to gadgetry it's more about do you have the story once you've got that down then okay now you got to make some decisions about how you want to do things and speaking of decisions if you can decide to hit the like button that would be wonderful um, we live in an algorithm driven life and clicking the like button helps let other people know that they may enjoy this video as well. All right, back to the content. So I've widened it out a little bit and I got like a little bit what I feel is clutter around me, uh, but I want to talk about each little piece of the studio. So we'll start with the camera that I use and as my main or studio cam. Now, everything, my choices, I made, everything about them were really driven by the fact that post-production is where you can spend a lot of time in content creation. You All the post-production work, well, it's a pain. It can be tedious and sometimes can take longer than even the recording of the video. You may have a 20-minute video that requires a few hours of post-production time. So to cut that down, you want to do everything that you can pre-production to streamline that. So we're gonna talk about like the camera, why I chose it, and some of these little gadgets like a uh, stream deck here connected to a computer that is, I'm pointing there because I can actually see myself on a TV uh, that I have behind here. And I'll do a other side of the studio in a second here. But it's all being fed right now through OBS Studio. So it's actually not recording on the camera. And the reason for that is, and we can press the button to see what happens. Now we're switched to my laptop. So it's now grabbing the screen on my laptop, main camera in front, and that was not a post-production scene switch. That was OBS Studio being able to change scenes. Now we can also change scenes again, and uh, we'll go for the overhead. And you can see me with the overhead right now. And then we press this button here, and we're gonna go back to main camera. So that takes away a lot of post-production time. So this Stream Deck, which was, I think you can pick up the Stream Deck Mini for less than $100. It was on sale for like 50 bucks when I bought it. Uh, they go on sale from time to time, but I'm gonna leave links in the description to every little component that I talk about here uh, with the exact models that I have. So back to the camera. This is the Canon C100 Mark II camera. And it is an older model camera in terms of, yeah, it's not 4K, it doesn't have these really super high frame rates. But if you're producing studio content, like sitting in my studio here, the camera has an extremely good low light performance. It has really good audio performance. And the audio performance is really impressive because it has two XLR inputs. And we're, currently this particular mic isn't XLR, but these ones are in front of me. And there's a mixer board over here. So this comes back to what type of content you're producing. And I produce multiple types. Me individually, right now I'm using this Asden microphone. It's an Asden SM30 that has both a stereo mode or a shotgun mode, which it's in now, which is a mono uh, only grabbing my voice right now, but when I have multiple people spread out across the table, well, the microphone, even in stereo mode, it's not gonna pick up the person furthest away as well as it'll pick up the person closest. So that's when you look at like a microphone setup. And once again, either way, uh, the flexibility of the Canon C100 Mark II means I can plug in, you know, these to a mixer board so I can balance, you know, three mics, three different people. Actually, I have a fourth mic if I have a fourth person on set, widen it out and then adjust each person to how loud they are. Um, our ears are good at auto adjusting to different sound levels that people operate at. Um, but some people, when you're doing post-production, you're like, wow, that person's really loud and that person's not. So there's actually a little bit of tuning you have to do to get that right. The audio is gonna be noticeably better when you're listening to it on this Canon with this same microphone than when I switch to this 
camera right here, which is still one I use. It's an older Canon 70D. I think this camera is like six or seven years old. Once again, it's adequate for what I do. If you're doing things like, you know, you need that really high speed because you want to capture something substantially better, well, then there are other camera choices out there. But this is the reason I went with the Canon one. Good audio processing. I had Canon lenses. Matter of fact, the lens on there is a pretty sweet lens too. It's the Canon uh, EOS mount Sigma 18-35. to and I also have this really wide 10 millimeter lens on here, uh, which is good for those wide angles. And uh, when I use this kind of as a selfie stick uh, to talk to the camera when I'm talking about a project when I go on site. But one of the things you want is separation between you and the background. And the way normally I have the camera a little bit closer, but what you're gonna see is we hold something in front of the camera. Now this box is in focus, but I'm not, so you can kind of see how it'll bring that. And that's the low F rating, F1.8 of this, gives you that softer bokeh or blurry background that you want. Now, like I said, the advantage of this is it creates a separation between you and the background, but leaves people something to look at in the background. Not necessary, but it's a look that I like and it adds a little bit of professionalism uh, to it. You can get different lenses for this. Obviously, this being a little bit more expensive lens, it's closer to the eight, $900 range uh, when you buy it new. So back to the other camera you've seen for the overhead, which is actually this one here. I didn't go expensive on the overhead camera, but it is important. And this is a feature of both the Canon and uh, this oddly less than $200 camcorder uh, for the above cam. We'll switch the overhead real quick here. So the Vixia HF R800 Canon camera is not bad for the overhead shots because generally I have the extra lights on in here. So I have a couple lights, which will show the lighting in a second, but the entire studio itself, this conference room, studio room, um, has a lot of lightings. We installed a aftermarket LED kit. We got rid of the CCFLs and I'll leave a link to where we, uh, those it, part of the building build out. We did these throughout the building, but it's extra bright in here. So you can use a less expensive camera if you have really good lighting on there. And I say, it's just a basic camcorder mounted on an articulating arm with a straight top down look. But once again, if you're doing a product and I'm holding the product and I've done, you know, a lot of different things I've covered, it's nice to be able to just reach over, I hit the button and it switches right to the overhead and I can carry on talking about the product. And as long as there's plenty of light in here, like I said, you notice that little bit of graininess with the low light with it, but it's better than, uh, more affordable, I should say, than buying a second C100. My thoughts are with buying a second C100. I really looked at it, but yeah, that's a, that's a few thousand dollar camera. So hanging it from above me, a few thousand dollar camera means extra rigging to hold it. And uh, I don't do overhead shots that much. They're just some basic unboxing, not the mainstay for my YouTube content. Therefore, I've kind of made the choice of not spending as much money on that. Now, whether or not you need these microphones, like I said, is gonna depend on whether or not you have a bigger audience. There's a couple different methodologies to do it. I went really basic, whoops, uh, and dropped these. These are just some Audio-Technica inexpensive XLR microphones, but they also have USB. But I'm using them with an XLR mixer, a older Behringer, uh, I think it's a six channel mixer. I'll leave a link to it. It's an older model. You can pick them up on eBay for well under $100. Uh, but they work pretty good, even though it's all analog because the sound processing in the camera is good. It's good enough uh, sound processing on there. The downside is you just have to make sure when you have guests on that if you're using anything setting on the table, this will make a lot of noise. So me just touching this table a little bit, the microphone's separate and mounted to a ceiling mount that we'll get to in a second. So if I thunk this, you will get a very loud deep bass noise. If you have guests and you're using table-based microphones, Unless you have good solid isolation between them, them typing on the keyboard or anything that vibrates the table at all, and depending on the density of the table, they'll be able to vibrate it more. Like if it's a cheaper, less heavy table than the one we're using, you will get a lot of vibration noise and you'll destroy your audience who will go, I can't listen to that. And you'll completely be unaware of it while you're recording. And you have to watch for a guest who like tap things. Um, Cause that light tapping, which you can probably hear on the microphone will be super loud when it's something like this. Just a couple considerations when you're doing it. And we've talked about maybe using the same overhead rig. And you'll, this is why you either see a table mounted ones with isolation or coming down from the top being held. But that's uh, depending on your content. If you're doing content, and I have a few friends that have asked me about this because they want to do some studio content like I did talking about technology. It's gonna be very voice driven at that point. It's gonna be very audio driven because you want to hear what the people are saying. Uh, so you got to really think about good quality audio and 
you know, being aware of your surroundings about that. So the next thing I want to do is talk about the physical layout of the studio. And for that, I'm going to switch to the other camera. Now you're going to notice a distinctive difference in the audio quality. I'm going to use exactly the same microphone, but it's going to be the sound processor that is in the 70D. And a lot of the SLR cameras, although they're really popular and are great for portability and keeping high quality when it comes to the video, the audio suffers a little bit. It's not bad, but when you've listened to how good it sounds here versus here, there is a noticeable difference in the audio processor. And uh, oh, before I jump to that, I will, I did say these are being captured on uh, different captures with the clean HDMI out. The capture cards I'm using is the Live Gamer Portable 2. I wanted USB ones, that way I didn't have to worry about putting cards in the computer. So I've got two of these, these Avermedia, uh, like I said, Gamer. These things are like $100, $109 each. I'll leave a link to the exact models I have here. Uh, they do work in Linux, by the way, but I am running Windows uh, for this right here. This is a uh, Windows 10 machine that's capturing uh, two with two of these and one of these. This is the uh, Camlink 4K. And I just wanted, when I was setting all this up in OBS Studio, I wanted to try at least one device that was 4K. So if I had uh, an input or I wanted to put something really high res when I was doing testing, I had something that could support that higher resolution. Uh, but these are 1080 captures and they work great. The also nice thing about these, they have pass-through. And why does that matter? Well, pass-through can matter a lot when you uh, want it to come out of the camera into here to be captured and be passed through uh, to, there's a, what we call a field monitor, which will show uh, that is a way to watch what's on the screen with a really high res, small high res screen to tell me whether or not things are in focus, whether or not things are color balanced properly. And even though I have a TV behind me that is showing OBS and whatever's on its screen, I bought a inexpensive TV and you gotta go real expensive if you want a TV that's really well color matched there's not much of a point in that because it's only for you to look at. It's not like I edit on it. It's just for me to kind of know what's going on. Uh, so I have the over here where when we get to that part, you'll see why we did that. And that's why the pass through is important. Uh, but that's pretty much it for that setup and the little stream deck. That's, that's this base studio that you see here. Now let's talk about the lights and a couple of the other details about it and show you how that works. Steve volunteered to be the cameraman. And so now you can see the other side of what it looks like and what I actually stare at. So the camera's there, the TV's there. So sometimes when I'm not looking at the camera, I'm looking a little above it. Uh, that's me looking past there. But that helps a lot because when we're doing the switching, the scene switching, whoops, and dropping things. I'll just pan down to that. Yeah, let's pan down to the thing I dropped. Uh, this is how I know what I'm actually looking at the scene and how I can like, hey, switch to this, switch to the overhead or any other scene and not understand exactly what I'm seeing. I can see it up here. Oh yeah, this thing is so cool. And they're all labeled, uh, the Stream Deck. I don't know if I'll do a separate video on the Stream Deck, but there's a bunch of gaming people that clearly have done videos on it and made it look really cool. Now, the other cool part, this is how all this rigging is done up here. And this is just black pipe, uh, black iron pipe that we got from Lowe's. You can cut it directly to the exact size. We cut it to the width. Now the pipe is actually shorter than the width, so you buy one 10 foot stick, and then you have them cut the difference. Is it 10 or eight foot, Steve? Either way, it's not hard we to measure. We bought a 10 and had them cut. Yeah, we I think 10 is the biggest they cut, came in. Yeah, and this and studio is a little wider than that. One and a quarter. Yeah, one and a quarter uh, piping. But it, they do sell equipment that you can buy that's like made for studio, and we price it out, and it's like thousands of dollars, and this is like less than a couple hundred dollars to put three bars across the top of the studio. And on the end, instead of painting or running a two by four and painting it to blend in, we actually used the decking, that plastic decking that you get for the, uh, like, Composite uh, decking. Composite decking. Steve knows the words. And it's pretty solid. What do you think, Steve? Oh, I may not be strong. <laughs> I'm not good at pull-ups, but it didn't fall. Uh, so I, I can't do that in the middle, obviously, but you kind of get an idea. It's pretty solid. You shoot a couple of these in two by fours. This was not like the hard part of the project at all. But what it does able us to do is get all these lighting back here. So we'll start with the back lights. These are the most generically named GVM for great video maker lights, uh, but they're really slick. They come in different colors. Well, they can adjust be different colors. Uh, they will do like normal uh, backlighting. 
normal like this, or you can switch them to be whatever color you want. I like them to add the backsplash colors. I'll leave a link where you can get these below, but they're pretty cool. Now each one of these is held on. These go by a couple weird different generic -y names, uh, these brackets do, but I'll leave a link to them because you can buy the brand name Manfrotto ones. And we have one of these as a brand name one, but I can't remember which one because they're all identical. Uh, oh, and these GVM lights came with a safety in case this goofs up and falls, uh, the safety is supposed to be able to grab it. But cool that it has it, but this is really solid. It wiggles a little bit, but it's got a little safety keyway so you're not going to accidentally drop them. Now, next light is going to be this. This is one of the aperture lights and they refer to these as a hair light because this basically lights me sitting right back behind it. So when I sit here, this light comes down and kind of is way above the line of sight of the camera, but you know, it kind of separates you from the background by having a backlight on you. It doesn't need to be a very bright light, that's why it's kind of a smaller one. And on the other end here, on an articulating arm, we have another one of those GVM lights. Now, these same articulating arms are what holds this camera on. Now to see how these articulating arms work is pretty cool. They can easily be adjusted to do different angles. They got like teeth on them. And once again, these are a generic version of the expensive branding ones they make. Uh, if you buy, I wanna say it's again Manfrotto sells one, but these generic ones are 35 and the Manfrotto ones I think are 89 or $99. I think Manfrotto is the one that they're knocking off. I'll leave links where you can get these generic ones. And once again, I did a comparison of them and I was like, well, these work good. Now, this is normally where the microphone is, but the microphone's currently on top of that. Just a flex arm and allows easy adaptation of different angles. So. The flex arm is pretty easy way to get the mic in the place you want. You want the mic kind of pointing at you and close, and it's just pretty standard adapters. But uh, this flex arm, like it, I was worried it would wander. You can put all kinds of things on it, it doesn't wander. We did extend it down a little bit with just another bar. That's why it feels like it has a little play in it, uh, but not a big deal. Then way over here, I'll turn it towards the uh, camera. Yeah. <laughs> this is the uh, Feel World. These are kind of like a generic -y. They go by a couple different names. Here we go. There the, we go. Yeah. This one is the Feel World one. And what you can see how it's glowing and putting marks on my arm to let me know it's blown out. Now, like I said, the monitor we have, the TV we have, does not represent color accurately. Um, this will tell you if things are like overexposed, underexposed. So this is always basically that pass-through feed through one of the, oh, through this, uh, it has a pass-through feed that feeds one to capture, second one goes here. So I can always know and just look at a glance uh, to see whether I'm in frame, to see whether or not uh, I'm overexposed or underexposed. And when you're working by yourself, it's great to have something close because it's hard to adjust the exposure on there, then go sit at there and then have to get back up and do it because you're not sure and the screen on the camera is just a little bit small for that. This is, you know, nice little feature, definitely handy. This is the Behringer mixer board. Nothing exciting about it. I'm no expert at these mixer boards, uh, but this is one we actually had. This is the uh, 1202FX. It gets the job done. It's got four inputs here and a couple other options uh, for analog inputs, but you know, this is the basic recording that we do for some of the How They Got Hacked videos and any video where I have more than one person sitting at the table with me uh, with the microphones. Uh, this I know goes on eBay for well under $100 right now, but uh, there's probably other choices and there's plenty of other people who have reviewed them in more depth. Uh, but I have no plans on upgrading. It's one of those ain't broke, don't fix it. It still gets the job done. Now for the front lights, I have these uh, Aperture AL528S. I've actually had these for years. These are really uh, kind of workhorse lights. They've been around for a long time. I think they were one of the first products that Aperture had a lot of success with. Um, no, they're not as high end as some of the other lights out there, but they're reasonably priced. You can battery power them with the Sony MP style batteries. And they also, when I first bought them, didn't have this, and I bought this later, which is the Aperture Easy Box, uh, which really is a nice soft box. Now, I'm not worried about the color splashing from the front, because uh, so, it's not as relevant to me that I have like extra color coming from the front. I just want fill light coming from the front and these soft boxes at this angle I mean you can see in the videos we've done with several people they work pretty good but it also is because that Canon camera can do that really low light performance so I don't need a ton of super bright like high-end studio lights I can actually dial in the camera uh, to say hey 
turn the light down a little bit and no problem. Matter of fact, the Canon has neutral density built in and I've had to use it because even these can be a little bit too bright uh, for the camera. So all those features when you're using like an f1.8 lens still make the Canon to me a really good choice. Having a teleprompter is cool and fancy and a lot of people like those, but uh, sometimes a whiteboard, as long as you can read your handwriting, we have the whiteboard just sitting on a TV, on a stand. I can leave a link. We got this stand off eBay. I think it was like 170 Amazon. Amazon. Uh, Amazon for like a few hundred dollars. It's at wheels. So I can roll this around. And these up here are a lifesaver. These are little clips that clip on the standard acoustic drop ceilings, uh, like the standard track size. And uh, there's what holds all my lighting and things like that on these. So all these wires keep them all up in the air. So if we wanted to move the TV somewhere else or at a different angle, power and HDMI are both coming over this. And then we put this on an extension cord. So yes, we can spin it all the way around and face the TV the other way and we have quick disconnects. We just put an HDMI joiner up here and an extension cord and plugs down here in case we got to plug something else in. It's actually such a simple setup. It's not expensive at all. Uh, relatively not expensive than trying to come up with a custom solution. It's kind of like the AV cart back in school. <laughs> Uh, but that's pretty much it for most of the studio tour. The last thing is this little mess in here, which I didn't take the time to clean up before the video. Uh, so you don't need to get too close, Steve. <laughs> uh, but what it says is a place to put everything and a place that locks. And I bring that up because these lenses and such things are so expensive and all the charging and all the batteries, uh, in case any battery were to have a problem while charging overnight, I had a little concern about that. So this is from Lowe's. It's just a metal storage box, basically like a toolbox. What are these called? Oh, they're Lowe's Cobalt Series boxes. Uh, but whatever you want to put these in, having a nice strong metal box that locks, one, keeps people from wandering off of things, uh, keeps people from going, hey, check this lens out, and dropping a $700 lens. And also, if for some reason there was some meltdown with one of these batteries, uh, all my battery charging and everything is in here. There's a cord hole in the back, so it makes it easy to bring it in through the back and then charge all the batteries up. It's like I said, it's a... Uh, convenient way to have everything in there and then you can hide your mess of connectors and everything and then lock it when you're done so uh, I do recommend having somewhere to put all that because you realize really quickly everyone thinks this stuff's cool and I've realized a lot of people can't resist putting their hands on it right away which always makes me worry uh, last couple things though I guess ProMaster this is the ProMaster tripod pretty generic uh, would I recommend a higher end one after buying this one it's not bad, but it's not amazing, but we don't move it much. This is like all the moving we do is here to here. They, they, you can go crazy expensive and buy a $2,000 tripod. I don't think it's necessary for what I do. It'd be kind of cool because they do have one that's got a fancy one button up and down, but eh, you know, not really necessary. And then um, these are just some hooks on the wall. I still have, occasionally we have light stands that I need because all these lights are on quick releases, so if I have to drop any of them out, I can grab one of these stands real quick, unfold it, bring it up, and uh, move my video to another part of the studio. So it is still handy to have some of these, uh, even though I'm hanging most things from the ceiling in a studio setting, but you know, teach their own. Uh, and a couple ProMaster booms. I'll leave links to all these too, some of the ones that we've bought that I've had good luck with. Um, and that's it, thanks, and uh, leave your comments below. Tell me what else you wanna know about the studio or something I may have left out, missed, or uh, whatever, But if there's or something I should go more in depth on, let me know. All right, thanks. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you wanna subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.